And good morning. morning. (laughs) Let's go ahead and begin with prayer. Father in heaven, we thank you for your love, for your truth, for for your kindness, for your mercy. We thank you for for Jesus and and your Holy Spirit. And we ask for your presence. Join us today. Enlighten our minds. Fill our hearts with your your love. And make us effective for your kingdom. We pray in your holy name. Amen. So some announcements. People were just asking right before we went live about the status of uh, our building search, and we have found a building. We have a contract on it, and if everything goes well, uh, we are hopeful going to close on that building um, this week, coming up next week. Um, But I I don't want to say for certain because there's always little things that come up might get postponed a week, but in the next week or two. And then after that, we will then have a, a serious renovation project to do to renovate the space so we can have a proper um, seating area for our class to meet. And that, you know, who knows how long something like that takes. I, I'm not a contractor, so I don't even want to speculate on that. So we won't be moving over there, uh, our class, instantly when we get the building. We're going to do the renovations first, and then we'll move. So we'll still be meeting here for a while. We want to tell everyone who's been supporting us in this project, thank you so much, and continue to keep us in your prayers as we're doing this. I want to announce there's a new resource for South Africa. Could it be this simple? It is now available in Afrikaans. And um, we want to give special thanks to Jacques, Vandenhever, uh, who spent many, many hours proofreading and working with the editors and translators to get this resource available. So thank you very much, Jacques. And then um, you can get it as a free PDF download from our website. Go to comeandreason.com and look under languages and you'll find Afrikaans and you can download the uh, Could It Be This Simple at, at no cost. If you'd like a print version of it in South Africa, um, then email comeandreason at, excuse me, comeandreason.sa at gmail.com. And if you, if you do that uh, and request one, um, you can have the book at no charge. There will be a small postage fee in South Africa. I think it ends up being about $4, something like that. Four U.S. dollars. Okay. I uh, want to give special thanks to Baker Books and the special work. They are doing a promotion right now on the um, God-shaped heart, digital, not paper version, digital version um, of the, um, the Nook for Barnes & Noble and the Kindle for Amazon for $1.99 right now. It's a short-time promotional they're doing. So if you know anybody who would like to get that, it's a, it's a real deal that they're promoting. You can let people know and get that digital copy and let others know in your circle. The God is Love children's book is available on Amazon, if, uh, and it's uh, at a discounted uh, price also. If you know anybody who's gotten it from Amazon, have them go and do a, a really good rating on that. Those, those reviews really do matter in helping elevate searches and so forth and um, purchases. New member section is open and lots of free resources. We'll do live Q&A again today at the end of class. Discussion forums are uh, open. People are um, participating in that. Uh, there's multiple other resources that are available for free. The Remedy Audio, Could It Be the Simple Audio, Music by Brad and Donna Horn, um, other, other resources there. And our sharing campaign is July. We're not doing a giveaway this month, primarily because our team needs to refocus on the building project at this moment. Uh, and uh, we will be doing, I think we're going to try and transition to a quarterly giveaway. We'll do a giveaway every, every three months, um, and, uh, and once we get in the new space, we may, we may um, be, make that more frequent again. So we're doing Lesson 3 uh, in the quarterly, Rest in Christ. The title is The Roots of Restlessness, and the uh, lesson asks us to read James 3.16. I thought we'd read 16 through 18 from the Good News Translation. Where there is jealousy and selfishness, there's also disorder and every kind of evil. But the wisdom from above is pure, first of all. It is also peaceful, gentle, and friendly. It is full of compassion and produces a harvest of good deeds. It is free from prejudice and hypocrisy. And goodness in the harvest that is produced from the seeds, the peacemakers plant in peace. I just want you, did you hear a contrast between the principles of the world, the principles of sinfulness, and the principles of God's wisdom? Did you hear a contrast there? Is there a causal relationship? Causal. Remember, it causes. Causal relationship between the jealousy, selfishness, and disorder and evil. What is evil? 
Do you hear evil and sin as the same thing? Many people do, and I don't see them as the same thing. Evil in every culture of the world. When you know what is right, but you're doing opposite to that. That would be, that, uh, so she's saying when you know what's right, and you do the opposite. Yeah, uh, in every culture of the world, evil at its root is defined the same. Regardless of belief in God or not, regardless of religion or not, evil at its root is exploiting other people for selfish gain. In every culture of the world, that's evil. It's not seeking success for self. That's not evil. Remember, the Bible says in 1 Corinthians 12, 31, we are to covet the best gifts. I thought coveting was wrong. No, coveting is not wrong. Notice what the, it's what you covet. Covet just means a strong desire for something. It, it, you could say, I covet your presence, Lord. Okay. There's nothing wrong with that. In fact, that's how to covet the best gifts. Okay. We, to have a desire to succeed in godliness is not evil. Desire for success is not evil. But when we exploit other people to advantage ourselves, that's considered evil. So, cheating in school so you get a scholarship would be considered evil as it advances you through falsehood and takes resources away from the person who did not cheat and you beat out by cheating. But, getting a scholarship through hard work and honest effort and you scoring the best grades, even though others won't get the scholarship before, because you got it, is not considered evil. You see the difference? Spreading lies about a competitor's product to ruin their reputation so you gain market share is considered evil. However, making a better product or working harder in the marketplace to, to promote your product, which gains you market share, is not considered evil. You see the difference? Passing laws that give advantage to some while denying others the equal opportunity, such as Jim Crow laws, would be considered evil. Creating laws that ensure equal opportunity for all to apply themselves is not considered equal, evil. This definition exposes, exposes two antagonistic principles. Love, which protects others, seeks to benefit and uplift others, versus selfishness, survival drives, which seek to advance me, even at the expense of others. So what is the emotional basis or driver or root behind jealousy and selfishness? Fear, that's correct, fear, fear of death, fear of injury, fear of failure, fear of rejection, fear of not being good enough, fear of not being esteemed or loved or valued or cherished, fear of inadequacy. It's fear. What is it that casts out all fear? Love. And where does such love originate or come from? The fear we're talking about here is not the, is, is the fear of sin. It's the fear that selfishness caused. It is not the startle response when a car weaves into your lane and is about to hit you. That is not fear of sin. That is an alert mechanism to take an action to legitimate danger. There is not a, some, I, I want to uh, 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 avoid some consequence of sin. This is, uh, or the alert mechanism or the startle you get if you get near a precipice or a cliff. These are just wired in biologic reactions. These are not um, the fear that sin causes. The fear that sin causes is the, is the fear of inadequacy, the fear of not being good enough, the fear of not being loved, of, of being rejected, of, of being defected, of being, the fear of, that guilt and shame bring, of, of failure, of not, of, of not surviving, lead, uh, leading to us to see other people as potential threats, as enemies, as competitors, as opponents that we need to defeat in order to advance ourselves. We can't get ahead if they're prettier than us. We can't get ahead if they're faster or stronger or smarter than us. That's a threat to us. I'm afraid I can't succeed. I'm not as good as that person. This type of fear is the fear that drives sin. Now, When we experience other people, though, through the lens of a common brotherhood, 
the various differences that cause us fear will evaporate. We come into a sense of unity. Can you think of an example in our society today in which people from all different cultures and backgrounds and races and religions come together and form friendships, cohesive, life-changing, life-trusting relationships? Different religions come together. I can think of a hospital because everybody comes that are sick. Everybody comes there to work, and uh, and you do make friendships and so on. And it's more not not who you are, any which way, religion or nationality, or whatever. It's what you do to help other people. Yeah, it's not what I've experienced at hospitals. <laughs> what, what I've experienced at hospitals is uh, is actually m lots of competition vying for the next promotion, vying for the best contract, uh, who's going to be, um, get the best call schedule, who's going to get the holiday off. Um, I've seen lots of competition and not a lot of, of selfless support. It's the military. It's the military. In the military, units are formed out of people from all races, religions, backgrounds, and, pol and political persuasions different beliefs about the environment they have when they come into a military unit. And in training and in combat, they unite around the sh shared common goals, values, principles. We're all Americans. We all value liberty. We respect each other's individuality. They grow to actually love each other, and it's called the bonds of brotherhood in the military. They form real friendships. It's called in the military morale and cohesion. And it's these bonds of love for your buddy next to you that even though you may be a different race, and I've seen this in the military, and when they come close from combat and they form these bonds, do you know they can make racial jokes with each other? And they laugh, and it's under the umbrella of love. There's no hurt feelings there because it's all said in, in good love and affection for each other. Okay? It is this bond of love that it overcomes the fear inherent in combat and allows fighting units to be effective, believe it or not. If they didn't have bonds of unity and love for each other, they collapse in the face of the existential and real threats to their life that come when you're, being, when you're in combat and under fire. It isn't, I will tell you, it, it, soldiers in combat are not primarily motivated by simply, I want to survive. If that was their thing, they turn around and run. They flee when the artillery starts falling. And that's when they don't have cohesion. They don't have love for the person. But what keeps them out there is they can't leave their friend. What tells them to get out of a foxhole and crawl under fire is concern for their friend. These are the bonds of brotherhood. This is a unity. Now, if you want to ruin a military and undermine their strength, make them less capable of succeeding in their mission, and thereby undermine and weaken a nation, what strategy might you use? Well, there's several. One, you equip them poorly. They can have good morale, but they have no equipment. That'll undermine their effectiveness. Or you educate and train them poorly, give them good, but don't teach them how to use it. Don't give them good education. Or you infect them with a biological agent so they become physiologically sick and they can't function. Or you can infect their minds and hearts with ideas that break down the bonds of brotherhood, that undermine morale and cohesion. Is there anything like that happening in society today, actively happening in the military today? And if we're not careful, will be happening in our churches? It's called critical race theory. It's called critical race theory. This is a corrosive and racist philosophy that undermines unity, cohesion, morale, incites bigotry, prejudice, jealous, inflamed selfishness. But in Christ, it is not to be this way. Jesus praying to his father right before his crucifixion, 
looking through the corridors of time, prays for you and me. Starting in verse 20 in the, uh, the NIV in John 17, this is what he says. I pray also for those who will believe in me through their message that all of them may be one. Father, just as you are in me and I am in you, may they also be in us so that the world may believe that you have sent me. I have given them the glory that you gave me, that they may be one as we are one. I in them and you in me. May they be brought to complete unity to let the world know that you sent me and have loved me even and have loved them even as you have loved me. It is through our unity in Christ, one, united as one in common values, love for God, love for each other, regardless of race, nationality, ethnicity, language, that we reveal we're part of God's family. So Paul writes in Galatians 3, 26 to 28, you are sons of God through faith in, Je in Christ Jesus. For all of you were baptized into Christ, having clothed yourself with Christ. There is neither Jew or Greek, slave or free, male or female. You are all one in Christ Jesus. Who do you think is behind a philosophy that divides, increases jealousy, inflames selfishness, undermines love and cohesion. This is Satan. There's no question about it. It's evil. This philosophy is evil. It's designed to break down and make us the divided states of America, a divided church, a divided people to prevent us from coming into the unity that we find in Christ. So where does fear come from? Two sources of fear, primarily. Lies believed break the circle of love and trust and result in fear and selfishness. It's believing lies that break love and trust and incite fear. Adam, he believed the lies, and as soon as they believe the lies, they break trust with God, they sin, and they run, it, run and hide because they are afraid. Okay? So believing lies, and the second is actually doing evil. When you do evil, what happens when you do evil? You become afraid, afraid of being caught, afraid of retaliation, afraid people won't like you if they knew, afraid of rejection, afraid of abandonment, afraid of not being loved. You're, you have guilt, you have shame, which incites more fear. This is what happens. It's believing lies and doing evil are the sources of fear. Yes. See, we see that second example in Cain when he murdered Abel. And then he's afraid. Yep. He's going to talk to God, hey, uh, protect me. Everyone else, he starts projecting his own murderous instincts onto other beings. Yep, there you go. Beings, yep. They're going to kill me. So if people don't repent and experience God's grace with a new heart, it's no longer I that live, Christ with me. We're a new creature in Christ. That's where the peace comes. That's where the fear goes away. If that doesn't happen, though, do you think people like to experience that fear? No, they want it to go away too, right? So what's the only option they have left, and what will they do if they don't repent, don't get a new heart, uh, are believing lies, and are also living sinfully, and, and so they're, they're only piling up more fear inside themselves, but they don't like that fear. What will they do to make it go away? There's two things they do. Blame somebody else to join them. They tell, yep, yeah, yep, yeah, yeah, you're exactly right. They tell themselves more lies. It wasn't me, it was the woman you gave me, Lord. I deserve that. Those corporations, they make so much money. I deserve to steal that from their store. More lies. It isn't evil. Sin is an outdated term. My truth is that whatever you can get, you should take. That's the law of survival. That's my truth. Well, at least my sin isn't as bad as those priests who must kids. See, more lies to avoid their own situation. And then, or, and or, both, because they'll lie, and seek more power, physical, political, and economic power in order to protect themselves, be a greater threat to those who they perceive as a threat, and to force others to comply and agree with their lies.
So the unrepentant evil, remember Jesus said those in darkness, they don't want to come into the light. They don't want to hear the truth. Lest their evil deeds be exposed. They cannot tolerate free speech. They cannot tolerate truth. So they will seek power and authority to silence voices. They will restrict free speech. They will censor. They will deplatform. They will eventually seek to kill. They will try to kill reputations. And ultimately, they will try to kill the voices themselves. This is exactly what the Dark Ages church did. The voices of truth were opposed. They were attacked. They were maligned. They were, their reputations were killed. They were fired. They were censored. And then ultimately, they were burned at the stake. You see the same methods being applied today from those who are anti-God. Understand, these methods come from the same political forces. So I'm going gonna, I'm gonna to start calling them, I'm not going to call them a party, the political anti-God movement. <laughs> there is a political anti-God movement out there. They are opposed to the principles established in the Constitution, so they attack those principles. The inalienable rights given to us by our creator, which were recognized by the founders, they attack those as racist. Understand what's happening. Watch for these methods and you will identify those opposed to the movements of God. Those who don't follow Jesus, who don't practice God's methods, will always end up attacking people. They will write blogs about people, certain persons, name people. They will make videos attacking the messenger because they can't defeat the message. The true followers of God don't do this. We don't do this. Do you hear us attacking people in here? No. We attack message, ideas, falsehood. We attack lies, not liars. Falsehood, not falsifiers. Selfishness, not the selfish. Fear, not the fearful. As Paul said, though we live in the world, we don't wage war as the world does. The weapons you, you, we use are not worldly. They have divine power to demolish strongholds. We demolish arguments and every pretension that sets itself up against the knowledge of God. We definitely are in a war for hearts and minds. And we are aggressive in wielding the sword of truth to destroy falsehood and lies. But we don't name names in here. We don't pull out people that uh, may be presenting a certain view and attack them. That is not what happens. Do you feel like we do that in here? No, we don't do that. We, we try to practice the methods of Christ where he confronted constantly the distortions and falsehoods to present the truth. But watch, watch for the other. Even the archangel Michael, when he was disputing the devil over the body of Moses, did not bring an accusation. Just said, the Lord rebuke you. Sunday's lesson asks us to read Matthew 10, 34 through 39. And this is out of the NIV, and it says, Do not suppose that I have come to bring peace to the earth. I did not come to bring peace, but a sword. I have come... I have, for I have come to turn a man against his father, a daughter against her mother, a daughter-in-law against her mother-in-law. Man's enemies will be members of his own household. Anyone who loves his father or mother more than me is not worthy of me. And anyone who loves his son or daughter more than me is not worthy of me. And anyone who does not take his, up, does not take his cross and follow me is not worthy of me. Whoever finds his life will lose it and whoever loses his life for my sake will find it. And then the second paragraph uh, says uh, Matthew 10 35 to 39 is really about allegiances and loyalties. Quoting Micah 7, 6, Jesus challenges his audience to make a choice for eternity. A son should love and honor his parents. That was a legal requirement of the law that Moses had received on the mountain. It was part of God's required mode of operation. And yet if that love would trump the hearer's commitment to Jesus, it required a tough decision. A father and a mother should love and care for their children, yet if that love would top the parents' commitment to Jesus, it would require a difficult decision. First things first, Jesus reminds us in this passage. So parents, or, or, or first all of you in here, because you all have parents, 
What do you think of the idea that you are to honor your parents because it's a legal requirement? How many parents here would like to know that their children honor them because it's a legal requirement? The rules say they must. In their heart, they really can't stand you. And what would happen in a heart of a person who really has no respect, honor for their parents, no affection at all, but the rules require they behave like they do. So every time outwardly, they always put on the facade and they behave very nicely, but inside they really loathe you. What would happen to such a person who did that? Do you understand that their character becomes formed in that of a fraud and that of a charlatan? It would be better for the child to say to your face, I can't stand you, mom. Because then you guys have an opportunity to work it out. Well, tell me why. There's an opportunity for reconciliation if you know. But this, I got to obey the rules. I'll pretend. I'll act. Be it's all about the behavior. So I'll behave right even though my heart, I hate my, hate, can't stand them. Understand this type of teaching injures souls and obstructs the plan of salvation. Man looks on the outward appearance, but the Lord looks on the heart. God's primary concern is the character, the heart, the mind, not the behavior. Behaviors are always secondary, never primary. But the imposed law lie has people focusing on behavior, irrespective of heart. The lesson also introduces a point that many get confused upon when it says, if that love would trump the hearer's commitment to Jesus, it requires a tough decision. Can we love anyone genuinely without first having God's love in our hearts? <laughs> Fallen humanity is not capable of genuine love. We only can love others as we experience God's love in our hearts. So to the degree that anyone lives out real love for another, it is always a manifestation of God working in the heart through the Holy Spirit, regardless of whether that person claims a belief in God or not. Thus, when we have God's love in our heart, we will live out that love and we will never love others in a way that denies God. It just doesn't happen. Any action that denies God under the idea of love is not godly love. Just not that. It's a counterfeit to love. And so this happens in English because in English we have one word for love. Greek has four words for love. And I'm going to break down these different types of what we call love and show you that some of these aren't love at all. First, a person can love their car, love their house, love a certain color. That's my, uh, uh, love certain foods. This is not godly love. This is not other-centered love. This is not uh, operational. It's not actionable. This is an expression of a person's preferences, pleasures, values, what they cherish what their heart's attached to. It is actually not love. Now, our heart's affections, what we cherish, that's what they are, that's what this is an expression of, it can be selfish or not. God wants us to love life. He wants us to experience pleasure and joy in whatever is true, noble, right, pure, lovely, admirable, and praiseworthy. He wants us to, to love those things. And if we cherish and love those things, it draws us back to God. But this can also be selfish. When these things become the source of our sense of security, my wealth means, uh, like the Jews in Christ's day, I have the, the, rich, the rich young ruler. I have all this wealth. I love my wealth because it shows how good I am. I love my good looks. I'm better looking than most people. And therefore, I will keep getting all the plastic surgery to keep me be better looking than everyone else. <laughs> you understand what I'm saying, right? I love that because it makes, I need that so that I can feel good about me. These types of things we love that are used in a way to make us feel whole or complete are not love. And if we love those things more than God, we will ultimately betray God to maintain and hold on to those things like the rich young ruler walked away sad. 
He loved his wealth more. Doesn't mean it was actual godlike love. Love, godlike love, is not about loving things. Godlike love, real love, is other centered action of regard and an investment in other intelligent beings. Another type of love is, is erotic love. Eros in, in the Greek, and this is the emotions of attraction and desire. And in the selfish way, it's attraction and desire to have another person, not to give yourself to another person. In God's design, there is to be desire and attraction for one spouse. That is godly. But it's under the umbrella of loving them more than self, and you want to bring pleasure to their life and share yourself with them, not get them simply to bring pleasure to you. And then there's a type of love in the Greek called phileo, from where we get Philadelphia, the city of brotherly love. And this is the love we have for our family members, but also our church family, human family, and the bonds of brotherhood seen in the military that I've already described. This is very close to godly love. But it also can be perverted by selfishness, in which people seek other people to fill the place in the heart where God should be. They need other people to like them. They need other people to value them, to desire them, to want them. They feel empty, a void, a loss. I'm not whole. And thus they seek others constantly for, quote, love. This is not actually love because they're seeking to get from others to make them whole rather than seeking others that they can pour into and share with. And then, of course, they'll receive back from the others. That person loves them and pours into them. But that's not how it's sought. It's sought out of fear of inadequacy, fear of not being good enough, fear of emptiness, fear of abandonment, fear of loneliness. I need some other person. This is actually called dependency. If you haven't watched our lecture, Healthy, um, Healthy Love versus Love Addiction, uh, in our um, Healing the Mind Chattanooga conference, I encourage you to go to the website and and, and listen to that lecture. I go into that in some detail. My book, Could It Be This Simple, chapter 8, entire chapters on love's counterfeits, and this is the biggest counterfeit to actual love that people often do not see because when people are in need of that validation, they will often enter into service. I will do this. I will do that. They may even abase themselves, become a doormat to somebody simply to get them Selves cherished and valued. Their fear, they're so lived, but it's not based on actually uplifting the other person. The real motive is for themselves not to be rejected. This is not love. Um, there is a, in that chapter, could it be this simple? And I'll only describe it at the very last paragraph. I contrast healthy love versus this counterfeit to love in relationships, and it's a little test you can give yourself. You can say, is my relationship healthy love or is it, is it a codependent relationship, which is a counterfeit? And you can just ask some questions because they function differently and thus your relationship will function differently. There's a whole long list. I'll just give a couple here. But godly love casts out fear. In a healthy, godly relationship, there really is no fear in that relationship. You're not afraid of what the other person thinks of you. You know you're accepted and cherished and loved for who you are. And you can actually be yourself completely. They can know all your flaws. They can know the wart on your toe. And it's okay. You don't feel inadequate that way. There's no fear. But in a dependent relationship, it's driven by fear. Fear of not being good. Fear of making a mistake. Fear of what they'll think. Fear of, uh, of, 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 of getting old. Fear of getting fat. Fear of uh, whatever. Another way to look, love relationships actually build up the partners. They actually gain. They get stronger emotionally and mentally over the course of time. Their confidence improves. You're built up in a love relationship over time. But dependent relationships are destructive. You become less healthy, mentally healthy, emotionally less healthy. And so you can look, in the time of this relationship, I've been in it for a year, two years, five years, ten years. Am I actually healthier emotionally and mentally now than when I entered the relationship? If you are, it's probably a healthier relationship than a love relationship. If you're not, if you're, no, I have more depression, more I'm tore up, I'm all the time stressed, uh, then it's a good signal that this is probably not a love relationship. 
And there's a whole lot of these. Uh, one more. Dep love is always freeing. Giving freedom to your partner and their partner giving freedom to you. You're free to be yourself and make your own choices without recrimination and retaliation. And I don't mean physical, verbal, emotional, withholding love and affection if you don't do what I want. There's none of that in a love relationship. In a dependency relationship, they're constantly controlling, monitoring, policing, criticizing. Then the last is agape love. Godly love, love that cares for another more than self, love that sacrifices to protect others, love that gets out of the foxhole and runs into danger. Love of a mother running into traffic. This type of love is antagonistic. This is the love that, that Stephen had, and he would not back down. So the lesson points out the need for hard decisions in deciding on whether we love God or our family. Well, if we practice godly love, loving God first, and then actually understanding how love works, there's really never a contradiction because we would rather be rejected by a family member mm -hmm. because we're standing for, for godly truth, bringing boundaries that are healthy to bear on that person because it's good for them. And if we went along with what they wanted, it would actually be destructive to them. So a woman who's being beaten by her husband and I get emails like this. Well, my husband's abusive, or my husband's been cheating, but, uh, but I love him, and I, uh, doesn't the Bible say I should stay? No. What happens to the heart, mind, character of the husband who beats his wife? He, it, his heart gets harder. His conscience sears. He becomes more corrupt. So a loving wife not only wants to protect herself, a spirit temple, an individual made in God's image from being damaged, she, if she loves her husband, she'll say, I love you too much to collude with behaviors that are destroying your soul. So it's never a difficult decision when you understand how real love works. Operationally, it will be a difficult decision emotionally, but not functionally. There's only one path forward when you understand how love. What's in the eternal best interest? What happens to this man's soul, this woman's soul, if we simply go along quietly, even support and tell them it's okay while they do actions that are contrary to God's law? It's damaging. Love won't do that. So when you really understand God's love and how God's love works, there's never really a contradiction in these things. Now, I do want to say, though, regarding the dependency thing and, and allowing your feelings for others to overrule your decisions for God, there's a natural transition from childhood to adulthood. In childhood, a child will naturally listen to and follow the parent, even if the parent is leading against God's will. Because they don't have the capacity to understand the difference. They trust their parent. Okay? But there's something called separation individuation that's supposed to happen between 17 and 25 years of age as your prefrontal cortex comes online where you begin thinking for yourself and this can often be a period of time where there's rebelliousness between a parent and a child okay where the child starts to question what the parents say that's actually a healthy thing because they're trying to think for themselves and not just blindly go along okay where when you transition through that and you become your own individual with your own identity then you give your parents in your mind the freedom to be wrong it's okay i love you mom you can still believe that thing. That's okay. I'm going to believe this. Yay. Rather than feeling that you have to go along with your parent for fear that they'll be mad at you if you don't. So I want to read you, Matthew, the same verses that we just read, Matthew 10, 34, 39, from The Remedy. Don't think that I've come to make peace with a selfish world. I have not come to bring peace with selfishness, but a sword to cut selfishness out of the hearts of people. I have come to cut the dysfunctional family ties, to free a son from selfish loyalty to his father's ambitions and feuds, to sever a daughter from the control of an oppressive and manipulative mother, to cut through the fear and hostility a daughter-in-law has toward her mother-in-law. A person's worst enemies are often members of their own family. Those who love parental approval more than they love me are untrustworthy of me and the remedy I bring. And those who love approval of their children more than me are untrustworthy of me and the remedy I bring. Anyone who refuses to die to selfishness and follow me, loving others more than self, cannot be trusted by me to, to distribute the remedy I bring. Whoever seeks to save self remains infected with selfishness and will die of their unhealed condition. 
But whoever surrenders self to me will, be, will experience healing of heart and find eternal life. Do we see similar struggles like this in society today? As people have not formed their own identities in God and thus have a terrible sense of inadequacy in their self and desperately need validation from others and they live in fear of rejection and fear of criticism so they go along with all types of distortions in order to be accepted. This is what certain views on gender are doing to our young people. I will just tell you. I won't say any more on that. Yeah. I'd like to give you a clarification because I think you've done counseling in this regard uh, in the military. Um, I talked to a guy one time who'd been in the Marine Corps, got out, and I said, I said because of the fact that I'd, I'd uh, had rides with a guy that was in the Marine Corps for two tours in Vietnam, and we rode together for five years. So I got a lot of stories. I got a lot of background on some of this. And I could clarify it to anybody who wants, wants that later. But anyway, he told me, uh, this guy that, that I asked the question, who'd been in the Marine Corps, I said, did you run into any real serious problems between black and white in the, in the Marine Corps? And he said, no. He said, in the Marine Corps, we don't have black and white, we have green. That's right. Milita Army was the same way. Okay. So, based on the idea that there's a, there's a built dependency, code, don't call it a codependency as, as in a bad thing, but there's a, a built-in dependency from the ground up. I mean, they'll, at, in boot camp, they'll take you from a worm to, you know, corporal or sergeant or whatever, right? So you got to um, you got to cooperate. You got to do things. To, so your question, I'm, to I'm make a unit. Well, yeah. the question is how how can you overcome this simple dependency that is built, where there's not really love being built, even though there's an esprit de corps, even though there's a, a spirit of, of brotherhood, shall we say? That is love. Okay. That's what I said. That is love. They actually love each other. They will sacrifice for each other. They'll step in front of a bullet for each other. This is love. It's not, it's not that it's functional dependency that I described. That's not it. It's love. Okay. okay. All right. So as Monday, Monday's lesson asks us to read the first paragraph, We're talking about the, um, the case of the aspen, which has a large underground root system that can't be seen. Um, selfishness is part of a huge underground system called sin, which keeps us from finding true rest in Christ. Uh, of all the expressions of sin in our life, selfishness seems to be the easiest to manifest. Uh, you know, I thought about that. I'm not sure exactly what they mean by that. Expressions of sin, selfishness is the easiest to manifest. Is there a, an expression of sin that is something other than selfishness? Yeah, selfishness is sin. Now, now it's true that there are results of sin in the world that are not selfish. A child being born blind, that they're only born blind because sin's in the world, and, and that being born blind is not an act of sin. That's not an, an act of selfishness to be born with some type of physiological problem. So if that's what they mean, all right, I guess, but it didn't quite sound that way to me. Um, is there any act of sin that is not selfish at its root? Well, here's a couple of historic quotes. You can agree, disagree. Workers Bolton, September 9, 1902. All sin is selfishness. Satan's first sin was a manifestation of selfishness. He sought to grasp power, to seek, and to exalt self. A species of insanity led him to seek to supersede God. The sowings of seeds of selfishness into the human heart was the first result of the entrance of sin into the world. God desires everyone to understand the evil of selfishness. A species of insanity, yes, it's insane to take actions that you think um, are rational and reasonable that actually are contrary to how reality works. It's delusional. And so Satan's uh, attempt to dethrone God ultimately in reality results in Satan cutting himself off from the source of life where he can't live. 
If he could actually get rid of God, which is not possible, but if he could, the whole universe would be gotten rid of, including himself, because all the universe depends on God. <laughs> it's created by God. It's sustained by him. So it's a species of insanity. It's delusional that he can actually do it better or sustain a better universe or, or create. It's like, it's like anybody in here believing that they're the king or queen of England. He believes that he can, he can actually run the universe. He just can't. It's delusional. So there's a couple more quotes in, the, in here about uh, salvation. I'm going to skip those. The lesson points to, to Luke 12. Uh, and this is uh, verses 13 through 15. Someone in the crowd said to him, Teacher, tell my brother to divide the inheritance with me. Jesus replied, Man, who appointed me a judge or an arbiter between you? Then he said to them, Watch out, be on your guard against all kinds of greed. A man's life does not consist in the abundance of his possessions. And then he goes on to tell the parable of the rich fool who built bigger and bigger barns only to die. And what's it profit a man to gain the world and lose his soul? When you hear stories like this, what law lens are you reading them through? When you go to the Bible, do you assume God's law works like human law, or do you see him as creator and his laws as design laws? This man came to Jesus because he wanted Jesus to do something. What did he want Jesus to do? Did he want Jesus to do injustice, or did he want Jesus to do justice? Injustice. This man wanted justice. But he didn't want Jesus to do an injustice. He wasn't, I wasn't come trying to get you to do wrong. I wanted you to do a right, to set things right, to do an act of righteousness, to do justice. But what kind of justice was he seeking here? Wasn't he seeking Jesus to make a verdict? To act as the role of a judge? To make a ruling? just like human law works. System of rules requiring some authority to make a ruling to enforce upon others. What kind of law does property law operate upon? Is that God's law? It's a natural design law? Or it's arbitrary made up rules? It's a human law system. And he's asking Jesus to adjudicate human law. Jesus says, who appointed me? There's an implication there. My father did not appoint me to run human law systems. I don't run a judicial government. I don't have a legal penal form of government. For anybody with ears to hear and eyes to see, it is a complete excoriation of penal theology. He did not come to earth to take up legal issues. And he uses this encounter to expose the contrast between what this man wanted and what God's kingdom does by showing the parable of the rich fool building, 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 but to lose his soul. Jesus focuses them on what they need instead. And what this man really needs is a change of heart. These two brothers cared more for their property than they cared for each other. Jesus wanted to restore love into their hearts, and he came because the kingdom of God is within you, to restore the kingdom of God within. The sinful world focuses on self, our rights, our privileges, our inheritance. We want a ruling by an authority, a judge, an umpire, a referee, a magistrate, a pastor, a CDC official. Make us a ruling. Tell us what to do. And then we'll be safe. Tell me what the rules are. I'm on base. You can't tag me out. Got my mask on. I can't get sick if I got a mask on. Viruses can't actually penetrate that thing. The actual data, we, we were right on this all along, folks. Community mask wearing not only did not reduce, increased viral infection and caused many other problems. But I won't go into that now. <laughs> Jesus said he was here to change hearts. But notice John 12, 47 to 49. As for the person who hears my words but does not keep them, I do not judge him. For I did not come to judge the world, but to save it. I did not come to judge the world, but to save it. There is a judge for the one who rejects me and does not accept my words. That very word I spoke 
will condemn him in the last day. For I did not speak of my own accord, but what the Father commanded me. There is a judge, but it's not Jesus. You, you know how, 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 the, the, how corrupt the system of theology taught in Christianity is? They actually deny Jesus' own words. He is not going to sit as judge. Rather, the judge is the very word. And what word did Jesus say, say he was the source of? I am the way, the truth. truth. See, the words of Jesus are truth. It is the truth itself that is the judge. Get your mind around this now. Sheep are sheep and goats are goats. Wheat is wheat and weeds are weeds. They're not made sheep or goats by the ruling judicial magistrate. They are what they are. The truth of a person's character in the end, those who've accepted Christ and have been reborn and restored in the inner person are sheep and wheat. That's who they are. The truth will reveal itself. Those who have preferred selfishness and lies, the truth will judge them in the end. That's why Jesus said in other places, by your words you'll be acquitted. By your words you'll be condemned. Because from the abundance of the heart, the mouth speaks. The good man brings forth good out of the good sort of It's the reality of the heart condition, and our hearts are either retained in the selfishness with which we're born, or we've been renewed with a new heart from Christ Jesus. That's it. That's reality. I, I, have, to, I have to finish a point here. Too many people today are jealous of others' possessions. Envious of someone else's achievements, covetousness, uh, and they covet someone else's station. They want someone in authority to pass laws to ensure that they get what they think is their fair share. And there's a name for this perversity. It's called equity. Equity is the application of external force and power to arbitrarily determine outcomes based on certain arbitrary qualities or results, regardless of reality, ability, achievement, hard work, investment. Equity is not equality. Equity is a catchphrase of liars, of the jealous, of those who pervert God's principles, of those who want to abuse our inalienable rights given to us by our creator God. Be very clear on this. God is not about equity. God is about equality. God's laws impact every person equally. And they don't discriminate and they don't differentiate and he is not a respecter of persons. It doesn't matter your nation state, your race, your language, his laws are constants, they never change. What can change is your character, your heart, based on the decisions you make to act either in accordance with God and his laws and wills and purposes and plans or to violate them. And you cannot get equitable outcomes with unequitable actions. It's a perversity of reality to think you can. Don't let your minds be damaged by this constant barrage of, man, of, of verbal manipulation using equity as some type of virtue that we're going to try and achieve in society. And it sounds so good. We must be equitable. We must be equitable. Every time you should hear that, you should hear, we must pervert society. We must corrupt it. It's called vile propaganda. It really is. Linda. Well, this touches a little on what you were talking about earlier regarding selfishness being the source of sin. The, this is from Patriarch and Prophets. The motive that prompts us to work for, for Lord, the Lord should have it in it nothing akin to self-serving. Unselfish devotion and the spirit of sacrifice have always been and always will be the first requisite of acceptable service. Our Lord and Master designs that not one thread not one thread of selfishness shall be woven into his work. Into our efforts, we are to bring the tact 
and skill, the exactitude and wisdom that the God of perfection required of the builders of the earthly tabernacle. Yet in all our labors, we are to remember that the greatest talents or the most splendid services are acceptable only when self is laid upon the altar, a living and consuming sacrifice. And then from Ministry of Healing, it jumps to, of all the people in the world, reformers should be the most unselfish, the most kind, the most courteous. In their lives should be seen the true goodness of unselfish deeds. Most kind. Quote Galatians chapter 1. Wish those men would just castrate themselves completely. <laughs> those circumcised group. I'll be kind enough to say that. But being kind doesn't mean you don't speak cutting truths. <laughs> uh, we only have a few minutes left. Um, so before I go, uh, go into another portion of the lesson, um, any, any thoughts, any, anything you want to share, Did, any concerns? I, I just said something quite um, antagonistic to the, to the um, narrative that the world, the, the, the wine that the world is drinking right now. Did you see the, the, the difference? Any questions? What I said, what I said, or what the world say. I'm not sure what you mean. She says the kindness wine. I don't I understand that. I don't think it's kindness what they're doing. It's cruel. Right. Okay. It's under the guise of kindness. Hey, this, is what, this is what makes the, you know, evil so evil. The, which is more evil? To have a bottle with poison in it that has a skull and crossbones on it and says poison, or to have the same poison in a Bible that says nutritional supplement add 10 years to your life? <laughs> which is more evil? Okay, this is the problem with what's happening in our society today. They're taking poison. It's absolute poison to the soul. And they're putting it out there like this is some panacea that's going to improve things. It's not. It is absolutely corrosive to the bonds of brotherhood, to the united fellowship. It's intentional, too. This is a part of a psych ops in the military, psychological operations, psychological warfare. If you remember, if you've looked at your World War II and other um, military history, um, the, the Japanese had Tokyo Rose. And Tokyo Rose was broadcasting all the time, talking to the GIs, trying to discourage it. It was a psychological warfare to undermine the sense of morale, to make them feel defeated, to discourage them. What's happening in our society today is a form of psychological operations to discourage and undermine the cohesive unity that has made America the strongest and the most glorious nation in the history of the world because the principles of liberty and freedom have been cherished and valued as a principle. Uh, and, and what, of course, what, what do the liars do? They will find individuals, and they will find circumstances, situations where, where the country didn't always live up to those ideals. It didn't make those ideals wrong. It simply showed that the country is, is, is built on people who have sin in their lives, and there's a lot of sinfulness here. But what makes America great is the principles not only of liberty, but the concept of equality under the law. Not the divine right of kings, where kings have different rules for them, but what we're seeing over the last year and a half with the whole COVID thing is that, in fact, there's not equality under the law. Story after story after story came out that the restrictions put on the citizens of the various municipalities did not apply to the governors governing those municipalities. They were above the law. This is not accidental. It is designed to undermine unity in this country, to establish a psychological belief system that that's only right. It's okay. We trust our leaders to tell us what to do. We just tell us the rules. Rules have to be followed. This is back to this corruption we just talked about, looking for an external authority, an umpire referee to do our thinking for us. This was never, I will tell you, the founders of the United States who were founded the United States on the principles of Protestantism, the principles of biblical principles, holding and restraining back powers that would uh, encroach upon our inalienable rights, uh, they said that there was one thing required for this form of government, this Republican form of representative government to succeed. 
an educated citizenry. Is it any wonder this is happening? Think about if you, if you have discernment, look at the corruption in our school systems. I understand in the city of Baltimore, they haven't had one student in 17 schools pass the math proficiency exam in the entire, uh, two, last two years. Tens of thousands of students can't pass math. What's going on with that? It's not just that. What are they actually teaching? What principles? What concepts? Godless evolution. There is no God. And if there's no God, then there's no moral principles. There is no truth. It's just what your truth is. Anybody who says they've got a different truth, they're actually a bigot and a racist. We can't fail them to hurt their feelings. Yeah, yeah, you can't hold them back. That would be discriminating against them. It would undermine their confidence. This is because it's antagonistic to God's design laws, the law of exertion. You never get stronger without exertion. You must exercise in the, your abilities or else they atrophy and shrink. But when we don't have a God, we, don't, we deny the principles of God. This is what's happening. Our, our citizenry has been, has been uneducated in reality anymore. This is why these things, and so they look for an authority. And when you don't understand how it works, just like a child who doesn't understand, a child rightly looks to a parent to tell them. And what's happened, we've made the, the, intentionally, it's purposeful. This is not accidental. People who, who crave power, they don't want a thinking citizenry. They want a citizenry that looks to them for the answers and to be told. It is anti-Christian because the principles of God are that we are to grow up into the full stature of Jesus Christ, develop within us the capacity to think and reason, and then mature those who develop that capacity to discern for themselves according to Scripture. And thus, thus, it is this system that we see happening today is completely contrary to the principles of God and what this country was established to help people develop. Gracious Father in heaven, we thank you for your love, and we thank you for the truths that you've given us, and we thank you for the way you run your kingdom, that you are not an authoritarian God who said, uh, I said it, you believe it, do it or else but you've actually said, come let us reason together. Though your sins are like scarlet, you'll make them white. That you will present truth to set us free. That you want us to grow and advance and develop into the full stature of sons and daughters who have individuality and can think and reason and make choices. That we can actually be in your image, children of God who act God-like. We pray for your spirit to enable us, equip us, and strengthen us. In your holy name, amen. amen.